What does men's evening wear and radar detection have to do with a small village in New York? We'll discuss that today on Footnoting History. Hello, and welcome to the March 8th episode of Footnoting History. This is Elizabeth, and today we'll be discussing Tuxedo Park, a quaint little hamlet in New York covering approximately three square miles and housing roughly 700 people. Now, just a few hundred years ago, this area was all forest and home to the Lenape or Delaware Indians from whom the area got its name Tuxedo, although what the term meant is still up for debate. In the colonial period, iron deposits were discovered, and soon the area was being mined until, unfortunately, it was depleted, that iron, but luckily there was plenty of lumber. Our interests, or I should say my interests, comes a little bit later, closer to the end of the 19th century, when, in this woodsy, rocky little area, Tuxedo Park was formed. I like to say that all children raised in Tuxedo Park know the story of its founding before they know their ABCs. After all, when the Cardinal of the New York Diocese came to celebrate the Mass for the 100th anniversary of the local Roman Catholic Church, he began to tell the story of how it all came to be, only to have the congregation complete his first sentence. No one was less shocked than I. Having looked into the history to write this podcast, however, I've learned that some of my memories or knowledge were slightly off. I'll admit, I think my version is more romantic. But I've decided to err on the side of truth, and if that's a pun, pun intended. Let's get started then, shall we? Tuxedo Park is located in Orange County, New York, approximately 40 miles north of New York City. The land had been in the possession of the Lorillard family, a name who, of those who have visited the Bronx you might also be familiar with. The Lorillards had owned much of the area since the early 19th century. The family made their money in a variety of ways, but one of the most well-known enterprises was manufacturing tobacco, an important product in the 19th century. In fact, the Lorillards owned the oldest tobacco company in the United States. To interject my romantic version of how the Lorillards gained the land of Tuxedo Park, I thought I had been told that Pierre Lorillard II had won it in a card game. Apparently, though, I misinterpreted the statement that he was given it to forgive a debt. In fact, it seems that he foreclosed in someone else's mortgage. Not nearly as fun, and seemingly way too timely. Regardless, the land was in the hands of the Lorillards since the early 19th century. Pierre's grandson, Pierre IV, thought that the area would make an excellent hunting and fishing club for him and all of his well-off friends. He spent some time buying all the property off of his family, siblings, you know, whatnot, and then, in 1885, he hopped a train north with his friend, architect Bruce Price, and when reached the area that would one day be Tuxedo, he simply told the conductor to halt the train. And they did, because back in the 19th century, if you were fabulously wealthy and just wanted to get off a train in the middle of nowhere, you did. As the train rumbled away, Lorillard and Price, who, by the way, is the father of manners guru Emily Post, that's right, she was Emily Price, trudged their way through forest and climbed until they hit a peak and could see Tuxedo Lake. Lorillard told Price that it was around that lake he wanted his hunting lodge, the Tuxedo Club, and cottages to be built. And again, because it was the 19th century and Lorillard was the tobacco king, everything was ready to go within nine months, courtesy of an army of immigrant workers who, in the same amount of time, created an entire town, including the Roman Catholic Church I've previously mentioned, which surrounds the village of Tuxedo Park. While it isn't as fast as the faux rock ridge went up in blazing saddles, nine months from start to completion isn't bad for all they accomplished. As per the Tuxedo Club's webpage, quote, Working with only the primitive tools then available, the men from this camp succeeded in building 30 miles of graded dirt and macadam roads, a water and sewage system, the first complete one in the world, the park gatehouse and police station, 22 cottages, two blocks of stores, the village stables, a new dam, an ice house, a swimming tank, and a hatchery, end quote. Five of the 22 cottages were chosen to appear in a survey of American architecture published in 1886. And in case you're picturing a rustic cabin, the title of this survey that they were chosen to appear in, Artistic Country Seats. The cottages and clubhouses of Tuxedo Park were intended for the American gentry. 
or, since we don't have a gentry exactly, they were intended for those on Mrs. Astor's 400. What is Mrs. Astor's 400, you ask? I'm so glad you did. Caroline, known as Lena Astor, was the queen of New York society at the end of the 19th century, and to be invited to one of her balls was to be included as the elite of the elite. The problem? Her ballroom only fit 400 people. Ergo, her list of 400 who were deemed good enough to be invited to snag a coveted spot. Of the families who inhabited these cottages in Tuxedo Park as its getaway throughout the year, all were on Mrs. Astor's list. Now, one could not expect the creme de la creme to be completely content hunting and fishing, especially because the pheasants and turkeys they were raising to hunt had the annoying habit of either flying or wandering away, never to return. Instead, balls and other social engagements were held at the Tuxedo Club, where, of course, one always dressed for dinner. Now, I've promised you two stories about Tuxedo Park, although believe me, there are more. But these two stories, about how men's evening wear, known as the Tuxedo, is related to the park, and where radar detection comes into all of this, should help you with a few did-you-know anecdotes at your next cocktail party. First, then, the Tuxedo. And I'll admit that this story reminds me of every Worcester and Jeeves argument over Bertie's mess jackets, you know, the ones with great big brass buttons. And it's not hard to think of the young men for whom this fashion was followed lobbing rolls or other items at the Drones Club. I would love to tell you that Tuxedo Park is where P.G. Woodhouse got some of his material, but alas, I can find no connection. In 1886, James and Cora Potter, two of the original members of the Tuxedo Club, traveled to England for the summer and were invited to dine with the Prince of Wales. Not wishing his guests to make a fashion faux pas, the prince directed James to his paler, who was instructed to make James a short jacket, sans tails, for him to eat dinner in, similar to how the prince enjoyed to be dressed. Well, when James returned to Tuxedo Park and told them of his fashion forward exploits, pretty soon all of the men of Tuxedo Park wore short jackets to the less formal dinners at the club and around the park. And then one night, even to a dinner at Delmonico's, an upscale restaurant in New York City, scandalized patrons turned to one another, aghast at the missing tails on the men's coats, only to be told, oh, don't you know, that's how they do it up in Tuxedo. That's how they do it indeed, and with that, a young man's choice of prom attire had a new name. As far as we can tell, this is the true account of how the Tuxedo got its name, but there was a long-embraced story in which Pierre Lorillard's son, Griswold, inspired the nickname for the outfit by wearing the short jacket to the first autumn ball held at the Tuxedo Club. But it seems that the version concerning Potter, the Prince of Wales, and Delmonico's is where we should hang our hats. Within a short amount of time, Tuxedo Park continued to attract members of the upper class, who wanted to escape the sweltering summers in New York, who were tired of boating in Newport, or wanted to attempt one of the massive slides set up for sledding during the winter months. And that, my friends, brings us to our second anecdote, and how Tuxedo Park helped the Allies win World War II. In the 1930s, a man named Alfred Lee Loomis had a laboratory built in Tuxedo Park. Believed to be just another wealthy dabbler in science and technology, Loomis's lab would shortly revolutionize radar. But who was Loomis? He was the son of a well-to-do New York family. He graduated Yale and then Harvard Law and served in World War I. He married a woman known as the prettiest girl in Boston. He'd been a lawyer and an investment banker. He had survived the crash of 1929 because he and his business partners had realized the stock market couldn't hold, and they had converted everything to cash in 1928. Loomis and his brother had some fun spending their money. They bought a racing yacht, entered it in the America's Cup, and watched it lose spectacularly as it came in last. They bought up Hilton Head Island in South Carolina, yes, the whole thing, to use as a hunting preserve. But none of this truly satisfied Loomis. Instead, he decided to take his wealth and return to his true love, science. And where better to do that than in Tuxedo Park, in which he had purchased an estate in the 1920s. Soon, Loomis had the greatest scientific minds of the age visiting his lab, including Albert Einstein, Werner Heisenberg, Niels Bohr, James Frank, and Enrico Fermi. The latter, I'll be honest, I always thought was a famous tenor. But allow me to digress from this digression. In a short amount of time, the lab had gone from a joke to the place to be for the scientific community, 
and the British, working hard to refine their radar abilities, sat up and took notice. By this point, Loomis's lab was split between Tuxedo Park and a building at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT. But it was to Tuxedo Park that the British brought their magnetron, a palm-sized copper disc capable of using microwaves to identify U-boats and help direct artillery fire. For Loomis, the magnetron was it, and his hand-picked team of scientists helped create long-range radar called LORAN, originally for Loomis radio navigation, but eventually changed to stand for long-range navigation. The Allies were able to use this technology, among other things, to provide cover for themselves while landing at Normandy during D-Day. The technology created in Loomis's lab is responsible for a good portion of how the Allies won the war. Within a few short years, though, Loomis found the U.S. government stealing away his best scientists to work on the Manhattan Project, as attention had shifted to atomic weaponry. He ended up closing up shop in Tuxedo and MIT, and embarking on an affair which, after his divorce from the prettiest girl in Boston, left him out in the cold of polite society. Loomis and his second wife moved to East Hampton and lived there until his death in 1975. And that, my friends, is how Tuxedo Park, a small village an hour from New York City, inspired a shift in men's evening wear and helped defeat the Nazis. Not too bad for a village with less than a thousand people, eh? I've included links on our website, footnotinghistory.com, to another one of my favorite stories, Polar the Titanic Bear, as well as a PowerPoint created by the Tuxedo Club to celebrate its anniversary. The pictures in the PowerPoint alone are worth a thousand words. And if you need me, I'll be dreaming of boating on Tuxedo Lake. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week!